Oh, please, a big round of applause for Mr. President. Oh, please have a seat. Have a seat. Ladies and gentlemen, so we'll now call on Mr. Joe Mensah, who is um, Senior Vice President for Cosmos and the former Amcham President, to conduct the fireside chat. So please, a round of applause for him. Oh, please resume your seat. And I think, yes, I think it's on. Yeah, you turn it on. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, it's working. So we hand over to Mr. Joe Mensah. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. And uh, thank you, Mr. President, for uh, the remarks you just made. And good evening to all of you. Uh, I'm playing the role of a journalist today even though I've never been one, <laughs> but uh, I'll give it a shot. Uh, I think uh, as, uh, you know, uh, Amcham and all the other organizations, uh, we came together to try to put this meeting together. I had the opportunity for uh, His Excellency to come and share these thoughts with us. We compiled questions that we wanted to ask, him, and uh, I think I will give the opportunity for individuals uh, to ask those questions. <laughs> I wanted to take the first opportunity to first, you know, ask a couple of questions before I come and uh, ask various entities uh, to pose their questions to him. And uh, the questions that we actually deliberated on, based on this that we just heard, most of what we were all thinking about has been addressed in here. But I think we will go through it. Maybe we can actually embellish it or add more to it. So the first question that I want to ask uh, His Excellency is that I'd like to take a look at all the uh, foreign investments that have been coming into the country since uh, 2000. And almost every, looking at chunks of terms, like four years, four years, four years, four years, it seems like uh, the, uh, the largest investment, foreign direct investment that's come in here is a little bit $13 billion. Two, only two occasions that we had that. And your term was one of those two occasions. And it was about $13.06 billion you know, dollars that came in here. The question I would like to pose to you, this is really significant. How did you make that happen? Thank you very much. Um, I think that there are several reasons for that. And um, the first is that we came to meet in the process several investments that were waiting to happen. That is from point of precedent. And there have been some bureaucratic bottlenecks in terms of making them to push. And so I became president, one of the first things that we was that there were several oil fields waiting for their programs of development to invest money. And the restricted enterprises were asking for different things. EPA was making its own demands. Petroleum Commission was making its own demands. GMPC was on a different wavelength. Minister of Energy was on a different wavelength. And so it's the investors came and complained to me. And so what I did was to bring all of them together with all the agencies and ask them to resolve the issues collectively instead of dealing with the single agencies. And that was a strategy that worked. And so with the Minister of Finance and Mr. Setekwe is here, he was the coordinator. They went out to Akosombo, they discussed all the issues that were outstanding and we signed the program of development and the investment flowed in. And that's how come the 10 field and the Sankofa field were developed, developed, uh, delivered. I mean, Sankofa alone was a six point something billion dollar investment to bring it into production. And it came into production just when I was leaving office. And so despite the hard work I did, I handed over <laughs> the fruits of the hard work to the incoming administration. It was the same with Tenfield. We handed over the uh, fruits of the investment to the next administration. And that, you know, ramped up uh, oil and gas production and it brought in more revenue. It actually tripled or quadrupled the revenue we're getting from oil. The other thing was in terms of project finance. 
what we did was that before then there had been this request for sovereign guarantees you know for any project that we wanted to implement and so if you wanted to do a railway you wanted to do an interchange i mean the investors were asking for sovereign guarantees there were two significant projects that we delivered and all of them major projects um, for instance the port and i noticed mr samara is here um, the new port we needed a new port the old port had become dysfunctional because it couldn't cope with the kind of traffic that was coming in. And any time I flew out of Ghana, my seat in the presidential jet is on the left, and if we turned eastwards, I could see the line of ships waiting to go into Temaport. And so when I came, I said, I mean, what's the problem with Temaport? Why are there so many ships queued to come in? And they said, well, the only efficient, you know, berth is the Meridian Port Services, and it has just two berths. And so it can't contain as many ships, so they all have to wait until it's their turn. And I said, but so why don't we get a bigger port? They said, Tema has exceeded its expansion. And so there's the design for a new port, but um, it hasn't been taken up yet. And so luckily I went to um, um, commission new cranes for the Meridian Port Services bed. And um, Asuma Banda is still alive. <laughs> But he was the chairman of MPS, and all of them were there, the MPS directors. And I said, what will it take to build us a new port so that we overcome the stricture of this one? And they said, oh, if you challenge us, we'll do it. And so I said, I challenge you. Go ahead and build us a new port. <laughs> Government will not contribute a penny. You have to raise the money yourselves. And that is exactly what happened. Gapoha and their partners built us a new port, which is one of the most efficient ports in the whole of West Africa cost more than $1 billion off balance sheets, but that was a, an FDI, an example of FDI that came in. The same with the airport terminal. Government used to take 60% of passenger uh, service levies and give airport company 40%. And um, Kotoka International had Terminal 2, which we had renovated over and over again, but the passenger traffic kept growing and it couldn't cope with the kind of passenger traffic. And so it became necessary to build a new terminal. And so I challenged them again. I said, look, Ghana Airport Company, bigger build us a new terminal. How are you going to be able to do it? And they said, if you release our 60% airport levy and give us all our money, we'll build a new terminal for you. And so Seth is here. I told him, what will it take to release their 60% airport levy? And he said, oh, it's been factored into the um, budget for this year. But I can assure you that next year we will give it up and we'll make up for whatever revenue shortfall. And so we did that and they negotiated with a consortium of banks and built us a new terminal at, you know, um, as foreign direct investment. And so we started to do that with many state-owned enterprises, including the Ghana Water Company and all of them. We said, look, open debt service accounts and escrow part of your revenues so that if you escrow part of those revenue, you can deliver projects, you know, to the people. Yeah, and so we said that, look, we're going to do BOTs and we're going to do debt service escrows so that part of the revenues of all those agencies can be paid into those escrows and used to service any investors that come on. But I think that where we are, we need to do more BOTs, we need to you know, use innovative financing to be able to deliver on these uh, infrastructure, project financing and infrastructure development. But more importantly, there's so many areas where if we create the right environment, people are going to come in. One, we want to be the pharmaceutical hub for Africa. Now we have the African continental free trade area. Already with the investment that I made in the pharmaceutical industry, they expanded their production lines and employed more people because we uh, gave the pharmaceutical industry six of them, you know, at that time 50 million Ghana cities, which was a lot of money, and they used it to expand their production. And they started to export to Liberia, to Sierra Leone, to Burkina Faso, to Mali, and this is just one sector. There are many other sectors where if we put in the right policy, we can get, you know, FDIs to come in and make Ghana the hub at the time we did all this, we didn't have the African Continental Free Trade Area. Now we have it. And so Africa is our playground. 
And if we, we can't do it alone, domestic investors can't do it alone, but partnerships will be able to deliver, you know, and make Ghana the hub for production in almost every other thing that you can think of. Wonderful. Thanks uh, for the answer. I think uh, if I may just pick a couple of uh, statements from this. Decision making, effective decision making, it's one of the things that I could take out of this. Yeah. And uh, creative, as you say, innovative financing is one, uh, and the second one that I could take. You talk about also talking about strategic, uh, you know, sectors. And that leads on to my next question, which is, which of these sectors, I know every sector is important. Uh, you can invest in the education side, you're not getting any returns today, but it's for the future. You can invest in a health environment, you're not getting any revenues from it today, yeah. but you need to keep your people alive. So every sector is important, but which of these sectors would you prioritize, yeah. say these are strategic enough and that where they will need most foreign investment? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. One of the reasons why we're having a rapid depreciation in the city, apart from the debt defaults, which is one of the major, major reasons, is also that traditional sectors that provided inflows of foreign currency have collapsed. The major and minor season in the cocoa industry this year is providing only 447 tons, 1,000 metric tons of cocoa. Cocoa has been a dependable, you know, source of foreign currency for since Gordon Gagisbeck's time. <laughs> Unfortunately, under this administration, management of the cocoa sector has virtually collapsed the sector. And um, I remember before I left office, every bank wanted Ghana's cocoa syndication. It was something that was sought after. And it made an injection of about $2 billion every year directly into our economy. Unfortunately, last year, we went for $800 million. I don't think we got all of it. But this year, there are no takers. Ghana's syndication has collapsed completely. And um, even though uh, every event, something wrong with the audio system, there'll be a glitch. <laughs> and I've kept, I've kept watching since then. And every time, there it's is a glitch <laughs> in the audio. So I call it the non agent theory. <laughs> and it happens when everybody is attentive and you are, you know. But uh, I was talking about Coco. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so we um, brought in almost two billion dollars in uh, Coco syndication, and Ghana's Coco syndication was sought after by all international banks. Yeah. And uh, almost two billion was brought in at 1.5 percent. In the last season, when we tried to go for 800 million, we borrowed at 8 percent. And this year, there were no takers. Um, the cocoa board went on. Nobody was interested in Ghana's cocoa syndication. And uh, they very disingenuously came and said that they were opening a new era in financing cocoa and that we're not going to go outside to borrow any money. We're going to finance it ourselves. Where are you going to find that financing? At 30 <laughs> percent? Testing mic, testing mic, one, two, three, and it's working. <laughs> and just when you start the program and you are right in the middle of it. Okay, so you can hear me? Yes. All right. And so um, we went, there were no takers. And so Coco Board said, oh, no, we're introducing a new era of, you know, not going outside to finance our cocoa purchases. We'll do it ourselves domestically. But, I mean, really, where are you going to get that kind of money to be able to uh, do that? So resuscitating the cocoa sector is one first priority. Shaking up the cocoa board and reforming it, making it more efficient, is something that we need to do urgently so that we can see a turnaround in the cocoa sector in the next uh, two, three seasons at least to bring back, you know, Ghana to its pride of place in the cocoa sector. Most, the farmers are not being given uh, the kind of return on investment that they should get in order that they would take care of the cocoa crop. And so many of them are giving advice to guarantee operators to dig out the little gold and then give them their share. 
So restoring hope in the cocoa industry is important. The next will be the oil and gas sector. We've had eight wasted years, especially in a time when the oil and gas sector is in transition. Recently, I had a commentary where I acquired my first electric car. And it's... Export. Unfortunately, um, eight years have been wasted. We've not added a drop. Indeed, there's been a 32% decline in the oil and gas sector when we should have been increasing and pumping on this business. So all you guys in the oil and gas sector, I mean, <laughs> you're going to have an open door, not only to my office, but to my residence. If you have, <laughs> if you have any issues, just let me pumping like crazy and get all that out of the ground. Otherwise, we'll have what stranded assets. I mean, if time passes us by, we'll have that ground, we'll have that oil in the ground, but I mean, the world would have moved on and somebody would need it. But there are many other sectors I talk about, pharmaceuticals, making another pharmaceutical hub for um, uh, uh, West Africa, Erica, is an area that we should look at. We're looking at the tourism sector, you know, making Ghana the uh, tourism uh, hub for West Africa. We used to be a lot of Ivorians and uh, 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 Burkinabes and co. used to come and spend their holidays here. Planes from Nigeria were always full, you know, when I was president, get a flight on Fridays and Mondays because people were either coming or going. And so we need to reach at that set up amusement parks, do the things that will bring people here, make Ghana Disney of West Africa, and let people come. And so that's a sector that we can, we can look. There are many other places. I mean, reignite the textile sector. Who says that we should start growing cotton before we set up textile industries? Burkina Faso exporting, Benin exports cotton. We can buy the raw cotton and produce textiles. And so attracting investors into areas that will create Ghana as the manufacturing hub of Af uh, West Africa or Africa is something that we, we, we do. And it's one of the things that we'll do when we open Ghana again, allow us many investors to come in here and make sure that our power set is more efficient. That's why we introduced the Millennium Compact. The intention of that compact was to make Ghana the most efficient electricity producer in West Africa because we knew that the West African power pool was coming and that's why we signed all the PAs because if we didn't need the power we could export the power to Burkina Faso all of them. Today we are exporting power to Burkina Faso but because the energy sector has been mismanaged and we're going to do a forum on the energy sector in the next world. Those are things that I will be personally involved in and make sure that all those agencies that will make business thrive in Ghana are working the way they should. That's excellent. And that's a mouthful. I think uh, talking about the industry that I sit in, which is the oil space, and uh, everything that you've said uh, really resonates. And uh, the energy transition indeed is going to actually move us you know, from the oil. And uh, we keep saying that uh, we didn't move away from the stone age because we ran out of stone. We will move from the oil to gas and to renewables. Uh, it's critical that we accelerate the pace of trying to get the investments in that space to do that because we just cannot do without foreign direct investment. So uh, hearing that, it's, it's, it's quite you know, uh, uh, reassuring. Now, another area is um, agriculture and agro-processing. And that's a critical area for us. It occupies a major space in our manifesto. We produce a lot of products, but what has been the missing link is buying the products of the farmers and turning it into value-added products. And so we tell the farmers, grow soya bean, grow what? And we give them the incentives to do that. We give them fertilizers, we give it thing, and uh, all the major agriculture. In our time, it was metasip. Uh, what creature it was, I didn't know. I told them, find a more farmer-friendly name for it. And then planting for food and jobs came, you know. But in all, the target has been providing incentives to the farmer to produce. But tying down the marketing and the value addition and has never, has always been the missing link. 
So how do we buy that cashew of the farmers when they are used and not get them going around looking for middlemen to buy the cashew? How do we buy that ginger of the farmers? How do we buy the maize from them, produce grapes and all the other value-added maize products? How do we buy the cassava of the farmers and produce the cassava starch, the gari, the cassava flour for the bricks and all that? That has been the missing link, and that's where we want to consult what we're talking about agro-processing zones in the regions and encouraging the sector not to now come to look for land with all the litigation and all that. You come and government has acquired maybe a thousand acres. We bring water, we bring electricity. You want to set up a factory, you set it up, you set it up, you pay a little ground rent, you buy the product of the farmers you use, we give you the incentives to export or sell locally. These, that has been the main thing because I'm a farmer myself. I mean, I'm growing 200 acres of soya bean and 100 acres of yellow maize. Wow. And I know what the farmers are going yeah. through. It's not the support that we want, but that after we have produced, last season, I got somebody who came and said, I'll buy your soya bean at this price. I had no say in the matter. And uh, I couldn't keep the soya bean. I had to sell it. And even though it gave me just a little margin of profits, I mean, it's the middle man who's going to make all the profit. <laughs> But this year is even worse because there's been a drought across the Bronga Hafo into the northern region. And that's how irrigation must come in. We must get investors who can acquire land and put in irrigation to increase production so that we don't have to rely on rain-fed agriculture. I, I mean, I, I speak for all farmers, even though my farming is at a slightly higher level because I have irrigation facilities. Yeah. So when the rains were not, I told them to ro roll out the spray guns and yeah. we, you know, pump some water onto the crops. So the crops survived until the rains came again. Yeah. But farmers next to me and other places don't have the same facilities. So how we are able to help them, either drill a borehole, give them some irrigation facilities, those are things that we need to look at. And so I'm going to be on my agriculture minister's neck. And it's, it's going to be the Ministry of Agriculture, Food, Agriculture, and Agribusiness. We're going to add agribusiness to it. Yeah. That, that, again, also, it's really going to be extremely helpful for us. As you know, we started Cosmos Innovation Center during your administration. Yeah. And uh, we have trained you know, thousands of people in the agri space. Right from, you know, uh, seeds, land acquisition, seed yeah. selection, planting, harvesting, and post-harvest. Yeah. Post-harvesting has been, you know, been, been a problem. And all of these things that you talk about is something that if we ever pay attention to, yeah. we would. And that also delves into AGOA, yeah. African Growth Opportunity Act. Working with AMCHAM over the years, we went and argued to get it renewed. Yeah. And it has been renewed and it's going to be expiring soon. Yeah. And it's very critical that we take advantage of it. Yeah. You actually gave us that opportunity, export stuff for free. And yet we haven't taken advantage no. of it. But it's also going to be very, very important. We talk about cocoa, which was the main cash cup for us, crop for us as a country. The coast, Ghana and Nigeria produce about 80% of our world's cocoa. <laughs> and what I just want to add in here is that Today, there's an inscription on a cocoa grown in China yeah. that says, cocoa from China grown in uncontaminated soil. Yeah. That's the inscription on it. Mm. And if you really read deep into that, it's a message that's been given to us. Get up and say, yeah. we destroy our outer bodies today. That's going to impact us. Yeah. How do you see us being able to put our arms around that? Yeah. Um, we even are in danger of losing our second position as a cocoa producer because Ecuador last season did an excess of 300,000 tons. This year we've done 447,000 tons. And so even the badge of honor we have as the second largest cocoa producer, we're in danger of losing. And even West Hill, we have always had the banner as the second largest economy in, uh, in West, West Africa. Africa. 
In 2022, Cote d'Ivoire overtook us. And so we are the third largest economy, no longer the second largest economy. And um, if you look at our predicted growth rate, um, Cote d'Ivoire is going to open up the gap. They're going to go to at least $83 billion, and we're going to go to $75 billion. Currently, they are $75 billion, we're $73 billion. And so we are losing a lot of, you know, a badge of honor as a result of the disaster that we have gone through all these years. With regards to illegal small-scale mining, the laws are there, mm -hmm. the regulations are there, everything is there. Problem with illegal small-scale mining is implementation. And implementation is a problem because the political class is involved in illegal small-scale mining. The DCs, the party chairman, everybody is there. And that's why I said the warning, that if you want to do gold mining, you go and do gold mining. Don't come and take a position in my party or in my government. Because we want to be able to deal with it dispassionately without any conflict of interest. And what we need to do is to make sure that the regulatory agencies are present at the site where that is taking place. Right now, in most of the mining districts, we have no office of the Minerals Commission, we have no office of the EPA, we have no offices of all the agencies that should be the ones, you know, looking after this sector. And so the first thing is to send the agencies to the ground. The next is to review all the concessions, who has what. We need to know who has what and where you are. What equipment is on the ground. So take an inventory of everything that is happening. And then based on that, we put in the policies that would make sure that you go according to the regulation. If you don't go according to the regulation, we take the concession from you. I think if we start doing that, we'll bring some sanity into the sector. But we can only do that if we don't have an interest in ourselves. I'm yeah. not interested in gold mining. I'm not interested in Galamsey. I don't have a concession anywhere. Yeah. And so if I have to implement the law to make sure that we police um, our uh, environment. I'm ready to do that. But one of the first things we'll do is to get everybody out of the forest reserves. There can be no compromise on that. It's not rain this year because we've destroyed the forest reserves. And if we continue to do that, a time will come when the whole of this country is going to be savannah. Mm -hmm. And so I have sent a warning, all of those in forest reserves, they should get ready. After 7 January, we're going to send people to march you out of the forest reserves. And I'm not going to be a clear. <laughs> and I'm not going to be a clearing agent and say that, you know, somebody is no longer in forest reserves. We're going to make sure that nobody is in the forest reserves. Okay. I mean, the last um, statistic I saw from forestry, 37 of our forest reserves have been encroached into. And if that, if that continues, a time will come when the whole tropical rainforest in Ghana will be gone through. And once that is gone, we can expect that it would have an effect on the ecosystem, which it is doing already. Yeah. The reason why parts, apart from mismanagement of cocoa butter, the reason why our cocoa production is going down is that we are not getting enough moisture for the cocoa trees because we are destroying the forest reserves. Thank you. And I think uh, I will ask the last question and then open it up to the public too. And the last question being, how do you see the impact or effect on the local content that we have today, policy and FDI? Yeah. Um, I think that local content is about a win-win. It must be mutually beneficial to the investor and it must be to the country. And so local content must be negotiated. It must not be imposed. And so in any sector where we advocate local content, we want to sit with the investors and come up with something that is agreed up for the oil sector. And today, one of the bits of honor our oil companies have is to show how many Ghanaian companies are winning contracts in yeah. terms of oil and gas services. Today we are all proud that we say this company is Ghanaian, that company is Ghanaian. But I remember when we were introducing the local content bill, 
us and Talu and everybody who were up in arms, the American ambassador, which ambassador, all those ambassadors of the country that had finished working in Ghana came and said, you know, this is your local cotton bill, you know, it's going to drive away investment and all that. And I said, we're not going to be the first country to use it. I mean, there are people going to Nigeria and other places where they have local content laws. And it is time to transfer knowledge, to transfer technology. And so let us introduce it and build on it. And today, all the oil and gas service companies are happy to be able to hold up Ghanaian companies and say, look, these are our partners. And it has led to technology transfer. Ghanaian companies that are doing fantastically well in terms of providing services to oil and gas companies. It is the same in the gold money uh, sector. I mean, I can give the example of uh, engineers and planners, which is my younger brother's company. He's one of the biggest you know, local uh, subcontractors to uh, big mining companies like Phil's, and that's a lot of the hauling and drilling and blasting for them. We can grow companies like that so that Ghanaians also fit from the resource that we have had. But what I'm saying is it must not be forced. It is something that we must sit together and we must negotiate. Wonderful. We will take that to heart. Now we will open it up to uh, the public for various. Uh, we have a mic. Uh, yeah. Sure. Okay. What are the trade associations? Yeah. Why did I have to start with uh, GMB? Thank you very much. Start with GMB. 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 Thank you. From the Ghana Netherlands Business and Culture Council. Uh, thank you. So you're called spell out your chamber because I don't know all the acronyms. Okay. Okay, Ghana Netherlands. Ghana Netherlands. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable uh, of His Excellency. Uh, I, I really enjoyed listening to you. Uh, you had a very good analysis of all the problems. Um, okay. Um, I've prepared, I prepared some questions, but uh, some of the, the um, issues you already tackled in your, in your uh, uh, presentation. But I wanted to come back because you mentioned uh, two things uh, on the review of the GIPC Act and also on local content. But I think um, the uh, Honourable uh, next to you asked about the local content. But I wanted to make a short intro about the, the, the current GIPC Act. Uh, which was established in 2013 that was done or it was enacted upon in, in, in under an NEC government and then in a new act because uh, in, in the beginning in 2001 you could start a joint venture bringing in ten ten thousand dollars and if you wholly owned was twenty five thousand dollars so that went to two hundred thousand dollars and half a million and now there is a, a new uh, 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 bill in Parliament, and that is basically the only thing which is now in Parliament which will improve our business investment climate. Uh, we have a lot of uh, companies in the Netherlands who, uh, for them, it's a challenge to get $200,000 out of their or out of their cash flow uh, to bring into uh, to Ghana before you earn one peso. And with the current inflation rate, uh, because you have to change into Ghana CDs, you will lose a lot. So that new law is, is excellent because it goes to zero. But, but now we are a little bit at a loss, like uh, uh, it's still in Parliament. Nobody can tell us uh, what, will, uh, what will happen. I mean, your uh, parliamentarians are about half the chamber. Uh, and, and what are you going to do when you are uh, instated as, as the new president of Ghana? Are you going to change it back to the old law or, or are you supportive? And, and uh, so what, what can we expect? Because this is, we've been basically uh, uh, talking about this for the past uh, seven, eight years and try to get this new GIPC Act. So I, I would really appreciate if you could um, tell something more about that. Thank you. In my speech, yeah. I said 
you know, pass the news, the DIC law. If it hasn't been passed, we have this administration. So I said if we come into government and the DIPC, the new DIPC Act has not been passed, we will continue and pass it. So that answers your question. It was in my speech when I spoke. Yeah, yeah. Spoke about it, but uh, uh, for me it was not totally clear uh, because uh, I don't understand why it's still in Parliament if, if everybody is in favour. I, I, I think the point that he was trying to make yes. is that half of the parliamentarians are from your section. Yes. Can you influence them to try to pass it now as opposed to waiting for? No, why not? I, I'm all for it. <laughs> and um, I, I don't think our side is the stumbling block. Yeah. Uh, there's not been brought to my attention that we are opposed to the new GIPC Act. Exactly. And so you're asking me to be an advocate and, uh, and speak, use my influence on the Speaker and uh, uh, the Parliament to be able to pass it. I'm willing to. But I say, if it doesn't be passed, when I become President, I have more influence to be on this part. All right. There we go. The question answered. What is CCI France in Ghana? What is that? Thank you. So CCI France is for Chamber of Commerce and Industries France in Ghana. Okay. So first of all, thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you, Mr. President. I'm very honored to have a couple of my uh, board of directors and chambers members today. Um, I think your uh, presentation, your speech, uh, answered a lot of the questions that I personally had. Um, and I can say that I'm quite reassured to see that there is an understanding of the importance of FDI in the country because Ghana was labeled as the brand uh, to be the Switzerland of West Africa and gradually lost it. Um, and as much as we hear it in speeches, sometimes it feels when you're operating in business that is not always appreciated. So it was quite reassuring to, to hear your speech today. We've had an exchange before on local content, so I think your speech was very, very clear. I'll I'll just say one thing since you've answered most of my question is um, the policies are, are, are okay sometimes, but the challenge that we have is in their enforcement. Um, and it's in their enforcement that some of our members sometimes come in and tell us that um, um, some of the treatment is unfair. How can we ensure that from speeches to policy, we can ensure that the enforcement of those policies will allow the foreign direct investors to have a fair treatment so that there can be a win-win. I guess that's my question. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, part of the proposal I made, we should be business and industry annually. I talked about the presidential luncheon. And there we're going to be discussing the industry, including foreign investors. And they're going to be able to bring up some of your concerns and what is happening. We're going to have the agencies that are responsible there. And so you raise, we'll be able to get instant answers on why we are here in the media. And so we'll be an environment where we're on the same wavelength. We're raising the concerns. GRA is there. EBA is there. Everybody is there. And you're able to raise the issues that are of concern. And we'll do the follow-up. We're not just going to listen to you, but we're going to make sure that these are correcting whatever it is that you guys are uh, raising. And so it's something that we'll be, it would have it every year. I'm going to be there personally. We'll have lunch together. We'll have a session the whole day to be a one-day program. And then I'm sure that it will give you enough time to be able to raise all the issues. But aside from that, like I said, there will be an open door. And we're going to have somebody in the presidency who is a go-to person in case any foreign investor having an issue. And so we'll give you a contact number, we'll give you a person, go speak to this person, and it will give you direct access to come to the president to find out what the issues are so that we can deal with them. And so you're not going to once a year to, for the luncheon, but there will be a system in place day to day if there are issues that you are concerned about, you can bubble them up to the level of presidency. Thank you. Why don't we go? Why don't we go to Amcham? 
Mr. President, I, my, my question is very brief. You did mention it, but my members are very worried about payment for goods and services. Um, and so what would you do? You did say that you had streamlined it when you were president, um, but it's become such a big, big issue and it's threatening not just their investment here, but it's also threatening investment from their principals into Ghana. Um, I can tell you for sure that there is a big company in the telco sector that has taken Ghana out of its billion dollars investment simply because we are unable to pay them. So what would you do to actually prioritize these payments? And since we know we are at an IMF program, if you can't pay immediately, these are reasonable companies that are here from the long haul, what kind of negotiations would you hold with them to ensure that their principals are at peace with investing in this country? Um, that's just one. I'll take the liberty to ask the next one. You did mention local content, that you're seeking the interest of the investor and the country as well. Now, the situation we have is, um, we have to rope in Parliament because there are certain agencies that have gone to Parliament and now they have the power to just list products every two or three months. One such agency is the Minerals Commission. So every time they release a list. So take an investor who has invested in product A in Ghana and they are supplying that product. And then in three months, the Minerals Commission says, oh, now this must be exclusively local. What happened to their investment? And they must act immediately. So that process of really engaging to see where our capacity is so that we would meet each other halfway has become a bit complex. What would you do to help in the harmonization of you know, such laws to ensure that we gain and then the investor also gains and at the end everybody is happy? Thank you very much. But like I said, it might be a win-win for the prime investors and for uh, local Ghanaian business. And so, like I said, anywhere there are issues, we are willing to look at them. One of the things we don't want to surprise is that you have people coming in and then all of a sudden you spring new relations and things on them. And so, discussing those new regulations and Give a time frame in which those things will come into effect. It's something that we need to do. And so, as I said, we'll sit and negotiate. We're not going to spring surprises on existing investors, but if we need to change the laws to bring in new regulation, we will sit with the industry, discuss it, and based on our decision and negotiations, we'll give enough notice and time frame for those things to uh, happen. Um, the other issue is to do with payment to uh, foreign contractors who have uh, supplied goods and services to the government of Ghana. That has been a major issue. We, when SEF was there, we implemented a giftness. Even though the giftness was um, introduced when um, I was vice president, we actually got it up and running uh, when Seth became the uh, minister. And it streamlined payments and uh, contracts. And so invoices were entered into the system. It was very predictable, you know, based on the inflows and the budget and everything that would get paid at the second time. Unfortunately, that has changed. Um, there are many people who have waited for many years. I've met many foreign contractors who have done jobs for government. And for two, three, four years, they haven't been paid. We're going to work to streamline that again. One of the things I said we're going to do is as soon as we come, we're going to have a national economic dialogue. And that dialogue, you're going to have foreign investors, it's going to have all stakeholders. And we're going to open the books and show the state of the economy is. And we are going to come with a legislation policy within the framework of the IMF program that has been by this government. We are not going to nag on the IMF program, but IMF itself will realize that a new government has come 
There might be things that we want to tweak. There might be other things that if we can bring on board, there are many things that if we were at the table when the program was on, we probably would have brought our own suggestions, but we we're not part of that agreement with the table. We uh, have learned more, most of the details of the agreements you know, after the agreement has been signed. And so if we come to you reneg know, on the IMF agreement, but within the context of the agreement, we might have some innovation introductions that we think we can, we can make. But I can assure foreign investors that they should not lose hope in Ghana. We'll streamline things again. We'll let the governments work again. We're going to activate the contract database so that any contract that is being signed between government and any supplier of goods and services entered into the giftness. And it will give more predictable time frames on which payments will be done. Excellent. I just want to make a point that uh, the giftness prizes that we run, I saw you with computers. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> now, not that is very Thank you, Joe. <laughs> uh, why don't we go to Spain, Ghana, and Chief of Commerce? Spain, Spain. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My name is Thelma McLean. I have a couple of questions. I don't know some have, whether some have been addressed, but the first one is regarding the tariffs for manufacturers. What is the new government going to do about it when it comes to power regarding tariffs? And the other one is also the new some taxes at the ports. That definitely, if you bring in a vessel, you find that you have quite a lot of taxes that are nuisance, that you can even pay up to double of that. So that is also something that we wanted to ask. Then also, normally what they say is some incentives for agriculture, but what it is that you are going to do pragmatic to help boost the agriculture sector to get the economic transformation that we are actually advocating for. So these are the three key questions that I wanted to ask. Thank you. Uh, the first one, can you... Agriculture. Uh, Value chain, the food systems. Food systems. Yes. Okay. Quota incentives in terms of... What are incentives in terms of making a transformation now? Because we're always talking about it. Definitely, there is where I find myself, I find it in agriculture. And we also speak about it. But we still haven't gotten the linkage between the agribusiness sector, the value chain yet. Um, there was a policy that says that there's going to be 50% processing in cocoa industry. Up to now, we've not really realized those ones. And we're even having issues within the cocoa industry now on the seeds and everything. So what are the things that we are going to do pragmatically aside the policies to actually remove all these things and actually boost the economy because everybody says that agriculture is the backbone but any government that comes in i don't know mostly we still come up with the same things but i don't really see the traction when it comes to the developmental plans in that thank you okay uh, thank you very much and uh, i think i tried to explain that when i spoke that a lot of our interventions in agriculture have gone to help the farmer produce more. And so we give them improved seeds, we give them fertilizers, we give them inputs, subsidized inputs, we sell size agricultural equipment to them, and uh, it's like being a shot in the dark. And so when you have put those things in, the farmer produces, and if a good season, he makes, he gets a lot of produce, but then who buys the produce of him? And then because there's a glut in maize prices, maize prices collapse because there's nobody to absorb the excess from the farmer. If there's a glut in tomato production, there's nobody buying those tomatoes and processed. And so the price collapses and farmers commit suicide. And so we've only been looking at the production base of agriculture, not at the value addition and the processing. And that's why I say we named the Ministry of Agriculture. So that it changes the orientation 
that is not just about giving support to farmers and leaving them to their own fate, but it's going to be the Ministry of Food, Agriculture and Agribusiness. We must create a new crop of agri-entrepreneurs who would set up plants and they will buy the produce of the farmers. They will process that produce both for domestic consumption and for export. And so the new focus and one of the things we're looking at is to make the sort to farmers more targeted. There was one time I made a statement, it was misconstrued, and said we regret sending tractors to farmers. Yes, I said on high night, the farmer does not have the capacity to service and maintain the tractor. And so we brought tractors from Brazil, government subsidized them 50%, gave to the farmers, and in two, three years, those tractors are on cement, they are broken down, because they don't know how to maintain those tractors. There's no sales service to the farmer on how to maintain those tractors. That's why we've come with the idea of farmer service centers and say that let it be somebody's uh, business to be the farmer and produce crop. He doesn't need a tractor. He needs the services of a tractor. Let it be else's business to own and service those tractors and produce, provide the service to the farmer. And so we'll have pharmacy centers, which will be private sector led. We'll provide all tractors, the uh, planters, the harrows, everything that he needs. He will have his catchment area. He would register all the farmers in that catchment area. And he knows that, look, this is the number of hectares under my catchment area. And so at the beginning of the farming season, provide all the services that the farmer needs. And so the amount of money that we budget to put as support to this is going to go to the service center. And as a farmer in that catchment area, you must be registered with the service center so that you get the support that we're putting into agriculture. And once you've done that, the service center would also be a microcredit institution. And so if during the farming season, you need 200 CDs, 500 CDs, you can go to your service center. It will be like a microcredit institution. You can take it. And when you have harvested your crop, if you want to sell it, market is your business. You can pay whatever you owe to the service center. If you want the service center to buy it, the center will buy it and store it in a warehouse. And they can keep it for you. You can sell some of it, store the rest with the service center. And when the price is much higher, and you can get a better price for it, and they sell it, they'll give you a portion of whatever is made from that. So it's, it's more innovative than the shot in the dark we've been doing. We say we spend 1 billion Ghana CDs on uh, uh, um, subsidizing uh, farmers, but do they really get it? It is subsidized fertilizer. You send it out there, a lot of that, it goes to party chairman, and it goes to party women's houses. So the farmers end up going to buy the fertilizer from a headdresser who is a women's organizer or a party chairman. <laughs> a party chairman who is a panic, he's not a farmer. You know, the only way you can get these to get to the farmer is to make sure that you do an audit in a catchment area of who the farmers are, know their farms, know what crop they are producing and all that. And then the farmer service center will be for servicing those farmers. But if government wants to do it directly, it will never work out. And so that's the things that we're looking at. Um, nuisance taxes, I talked about them. I said we want to rationalize the taxes. We're going to look at them. There are taxes on tax, some are cascading. You go to the same market and somebody is uh, zero VAT rated. He is charging. 3% uh, back flat rate. Another person is charging, and they're all selling in the same market. And so how do we rationalize it so that if they're all selling in Abusio kind, they have a rate that everybody, you know, is, has an incentive to pay. Because of who are evading the VAT anyway. And so you're not getting optimum option from the VAT. If we rationalize it, it's easier to pay. We're going to make much more than the current regime that we have. And so we're going to rationalize it so that uh, taxes, and you talked about the port, there are levies upon levies, some are illegal levies. You know, all kinds of agencies have imposed levies. Collecting 
illegal levies. I mean, those are not levies that they should be collected. I pay my shipping, I come back, then they say some agent has my document, and he says I should pay some money before he gives my document. So why are you the agent of whoever is up there? I paid for my shipping. Your, your, the, your principal should pay you what is owed. But when I come, you give me, I pay you a certain amount of money. And after I finish paying, they say, and staffing charge, such. Uh, the last time I, I, I met those two kind of people and I read the taxes on one vehicle. And while I was reading the taxes, they were counting. And we counted 23 different charges. So how do we rationalize it to make our port more competitive? Under that port, so that we can bring in more volumes. Unfortunately, the volumes have not come because um, we're, char we're, we're charging too many. People are going to Lome with goods that are meant for Ghana and taking them through Lome ports, paying by road and bringing the goods to Ghana. So how do we make our port competitive? It's something we're going to do with all the stakeholders and we we'll agree on how to reach uh, so that all of us are able to um, uh, make business. Uh, power has been one of the major problems, power tariffs. And um, the problem with our power is that in many places, residential power is more expensive than tariffs to businesses and industry in the reverse. For political reasons, power to residential consumers is lower than power to business. We need to see how we can twist that. But we can, always, we can only flip that if we improve collections. We have technical losses and we have collection losses. Carry our losses, if I know from the last few guys, almost 32% of all the power we drive through our transmission. There is no electricity company in the world that can survive with 32% losses. So how do we make the collection more efficient? And that's why we signed the Millennium Compact with the US. It was to make our power sector the most efficient. We implemented all parts of the compact and we came to the last part of the compact and I just regret that we didn't get that done and whatever happened, happened. Because that was the distribution end. That was going to introduce private participation at the distribution end. Fortunately, there was a squabble over the shares in PDS, and so on and so forth, and it became a whole mess. And so US withdrew $190 million. But I believe that if we had moved that compact to the end, they would have a very efficient electricity distribution system we would have been recovering of the money from the distribution and everybody would have been paying less. And with the PPA signed, we would have had excess power. Today, the line to Burkina Faso, which was financed, we signed the agreement in my time with Agence France de Development to open the line to Burkina Faso so that we could ev evacuate excess power under the West African Power Pool. We did all that thing of additional power because we knew the West African power pool was coming. I think the new government came, they didn't have the same vision as us. They said, why did you sign so many excess power agreements and it is, you know, there's excess capacity and all that. But a lot of that power was going to be evacuated and so to Cote to Burkina Faso, to Mali and all that. And so today, unfortunately, we've had to cut down the supply to our partners with whom we have agreements. And the point is, when you do that, they look for alternative sources of power. And so by the time ready to give them power again, they might have developed their own uh, 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 different sources of power. And they'll say, well, you're not a rebel partner. We don't need the power from you. And it's all because we've mismanaged the power. ESLA, that was supposed to provide extra revenue to pay off SC debt, has been collateralized. And we're going to audit how that ESLA money was spent. It was meant for the power sector. What was it spent on? Was it misaligned to the budget? Those are all things that Daniels must know. And so we're going to do a forensic audit into all those things so that we learn lessons from them. We can't just under the carpet. 
these are things that we must go into so that tomorrow another government doesn't come and do the same things. But I believe that we can turn the power sector around. One of the strategies we have is to push forward with the private sector participation in distribution. In our time, we did the Enclave Power Project, which supplied power to the free. And collection was 99% because it was private sector. ECB had a bulk flow meter to the Enclave, and Enclave Power was the one that had the meters, they collected bills, they prepared the bills and everything. If we bring the private sector in, we prove collection won't have to bother about prepaid meters. They would put those meters there. They would, you know, make sure that bills are collected. And ECG will get its money because you have flow meter and they pay for the power that you supplied. But until we do that and introduce efficiency, we have a lopsided power sector we need to flip it so that businesses can get power cheaper and employable because they'll be operating more efficiently. Uh, and I think uh, the, the transmission, you know, loss of transmission is yeah. very, very key. It was in this very room here when we launched the uh, final piece of the Millennium Challenge. Yeah. And uh, the U.S. Ambassador, you know, at that time I happened to be the president of Amsham. We were on phones at midnight trying to figure out a project. So until we resolve that, we will continue to have issues in this space. The decision was to upgrade the transmission yes. system to cut down the yes. technical losses. That's correct. And that work started, and I think it's still ongoing, but we need to speed it up so that we can cut down the technical losses, but also cut down the commercial losses by being able to, you know, the revenue for the electricity that's supplied. By the way, go to Jetro. That's right, Okay, so I'm from Jetro, as was announced. Um, so many corporations and investors care about the social, cultural environment in which they operate, and they might not necessarily want to enter an environment where there might not be equal rights or some issues. So if passed, how are you going to reconcile the family values bill with attracting FDI, especially from the Western world? Well, um, you know, we are a diverse world, and um, that is how God created us. We have different cultures. And um, we have a bill that was introduced in Parliament. We're looking at two things here. We're looking at the concept of democracy, of which the West has been the big advocate, that we should adopt democratic systems. So we've adopted democracy. We have constitutional governance and everything. And it says that Parliament is a real Parliament, and it can pass bills and acts for this country. And so the sovereign parliament of this country passes a bill and it is passed unanimously without objection. And so one, you're telling the president that he should object to the representatives of the people who have passed something unanimously. So that's the first part of it. The second part is we have a culture and Culture is an embodiment of the traditions of the people. There might be new things that come that are not in tune with the culture. You cannot force it. Because when you force it, you get pushback. And so this is something that we must look at carefully. But I can just give you what the situation is now. The bill was passed is waiting for presidential assent. A citizen of this country for injunction, not only against the president signing, but also against the Speaker of Parliament submitting the bill to the president. Point. And that injunction is before this report. And so we're all waiting for the next step for the Supreme Court to adjust whether the 
speaker can send the bill to the president and whether the president can sign it because they said it goes against human rights and things. So let's let the democratic and the judicial process work. Let the uh, Supreme Court pronounce. But I just say two more things. One, the Constitution says that if Supreme Court rules that it's okay for the, uh, the speaker to the bill for accents, and it also says that whoever injuncted the president has no right to injunct the president, and the president has two courses of action. To either, three courses. One, to either sign the bill into law, or two, to return the bill to parliament because he objects, stating the reasons for which he is, or three, to refer the bill to the Council of State for advice. Those are the three courses of action open to the president. And so if the Supreme Court rules, then those, uh, if, if this, it's not right for the speaker to submit the bill because it goes against human rights, then it's a different matter. If they say, yes, the speaker can submit it, and the person who filed the injunction has no right to injunct the president, then the three courses of action are open to the president. But there's a fourth thing. The life of Parliament ends on 6th January. And so on 6th January, if none of these happen, the bill expires. And so if the voters of the bill want to bring it again, have to bring it as a new bill to the next Parliament. So that's the current situation in which we But we must look at all the issues of democracy and all, but also look at the issues of culture, and people's sensibilities and all. And uh, in all that context, I know Ghana will find a way. And so we'll see what happens. I think they have two weeks or so yeah. to advise the president. I'm not sure, but. Uh, why don't we go to Canada? But let me add that the issues of that bill, even in advanced countries, has not been settled. I mean, in America and everywhere, there are issues to do with that, whatever you're talking about. And so, even in the advanced countries, they've not quite settled the matter. And so, of course, you can understand that we have issues here. Good evening. My name is Presla from Canada, Ghana Chamber. My question is, um, I've had a couple of conversations with some foreign investors who came to Ghana to do business. And the issue was that they complained bitterly about our city fluctuation. They complained bitterly about the policies, some of the policies we have in this country. They complained bitterly about how they struggle going through middlemen to get a lot of things like registration of their businesses, um, tax, taxes in this country is eating them up. Now, this brings me to my question. My question is, how will your administration, your excellency, address potential concerns from foreign investors regarding regulatory and political stability? And secondly, what steps will you take to ensure that the foreign direct investments are distributed equitably across different regions and sectors? Thank you. Mm, thank you. Uh, that is two questions in one. Um, the first one is um, how we can ease doing business so foreign investors are able to um, do things you know, more directly without having to go through middlemen. Um, in the past, we had what we call the Gateway Secretariat. And we measured all the state agencies that were providing services to business by how quick they were able to respond. And I think that that brought Ghana to the number one position, ease of doing business in West Africa. Unfortunately, at that time, we have backslided. Today, we're no longer the number one in West Africa in ease of doing business. We to work our way back to be able to uh, reach that uh, position. And so we must start a monitoring mechanism where we test from time to time how quick these things happen, 
how quickly is a business registered? And we get the registrar general and, and say that, look, um, we, somebody wanted to register a business and this is how long they took them. And I remember Gateway, um, during the time of the Gateway uh, uh, Secretary, um, they used to get a feedback from immigration. People arrived at the airport, how quickly they were cleared through immigration. And uh, if they wanted, to, uh, whatever they wanted to do with government, how quickly they were able to uh, get access to um, the services that were required. We need to begin to monitor again so that we're able to uh, get all the government agencies working at par. Now there's a whole plethora of people they call Goro Boys who you have to go and see and give a little something and in the shortest possible time they will get you what you're looking for. But if you go yourself, you would be frustrated and frustrated and up and go to a Goro Boy and then suddenly what you are looking for you get it at once. It is a whole culture of bribery. You know, and there are people in those agencies who get a part of what the guru boys are getting. You, they don't do it, they do it, and they go and give the, a part of it to whoever are benefiting. So we need to begin the monitoring again. If it means getting back the Gateway Secretariat to monitor in real time how government agencies are responding to requests from business, something that we need to look at. And uh, what was the next question? I didn't write it down, unfortunately. Your Excellency, the yes. next question was, what steps will you take to ensure that the foreign direct investments oh, yeah, are yeah, distributed yeah. equitably in various is, regions and sectors? That Thank is you. important. You know, and for me, yes, we have had incentives for foreign investors to pan out across the country. And so, for instance, we have an incentive where you have tax holidays for investors who invest in a rural district or a rural area or some part of the country. Unfortunately, until we act together, people are going to find it difficult to go to other places because, one, you have logistical issues to look at. Two, you need to look at uh, sources of raw material. Three, you need to look at reliability of and access to enough power. You need to look at access to water and all that. And normally, you would get the best reliability in terms of power, in terms of water, in terms of logistics, close to the capital. And that is why the majority of businesses cluster around the capital. But then we spread out, you know, the incentives for them to be able to do it. The railway lines, putting the highways, so that able to move goods and services fast across our country, you can give the best tax incentives to get people to move to other places. And that's why infrastructure comes in. And that's why we're talking about the big push, that over the next five years, we want to invest $2 billion a year into infrastructure, especially economic infrastructure, to open up the roads, you know, goods and services can move to invest in the railways so that people can move, you know, products across the country seamlessly, you know, to be able to uh, strengthen the supply of electricity to all parts of the country to ensure that more water is available to all our major regional capitals. So whoever goes to invest there will not be disadvantaged because they invested there. So it comes with improving the infrastructure and um, it's not only tax incentives that will let them move there, but it's also strengthening the infrastructure obstacle support that will let people go and invest in other parts of the country. You cannot force a foreign a direct investor and match him to Ballroom Town to go and invest there when he does not have enough electricity power, he does not have uh, enough water, he doesn't have a good road to evacuate his products. And so it will be improving the infrastructure in addition to uh, incentives, you know, that will make people pan out across the country. But we need to do that because once we don't do that, we create a lopsided development. And that is why everybody is trooping to Accra. And the social services and economic services are no longer able to sustain the huge population increase in Accra. And so we need to look at other places. I've talked about a new city, which will be somewhere 
in the confluence of Eastern Region, Volta, and Greater Accra. And there will be the Volta, you know, uh, uh, running through the city. There will be a fast uh, transport link between Accra and the city. And it will be a smart to have an industrial hub so that we move some of the development out of Accra, not only Tema and other places, but move it a bit more inward and um, create an opportunity. It will be a tourism hub. We'll put all the amusement parks and water parks and hotels and everything so that people will come from different uh, uh, African countries and also come to enjoy the hospita hospitality of them. Thank you. We have a few more questions. Uh, we will go to uh, Ghana, South Africa, Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Your Excellency. Your framework for economic transformation is clear. The members of the South African uh, Chamber will be pleased to hear that. Sadly, though, over the last decade, our contribution to the foreign direct investment component has dwindled. Uh, we used to be very close to the top of the league table. We hope that that will change with what you've laid out. <coughs> With the aspirations that you've set out, it strikes me that it's going to need two things, liquidity, and lots of it, and an enabler to distribute the liquidity. Probably it's a technology platform. So I would invite you to speak about the importance of the digital economy, um, and then a robust local financial services sector. Not the money that comes in from foreigners, but the money and liquidity required by smaller Ghanaian companies that are able to supply services to those inbound companies. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. you know, the most important thing, and that is going to be the prime objective, is to stabilize the economy and to stabilize the currency and to bring down inflation and to create a macro environment that is conducive to business. That is one uh, um, objective. Because in the environment, no business can thrive. And so that will be a major um, um, outlook. Aside from that, improving fintech space Implementing digitizing in the economy to introduce transparency and reduce human discretion in many things is the way to go. I spent time as Deputy Minister of Communications and Minister of Communications and then as uh, Vice President and President putting in the nature in order that we can have a digital uh, takeoff. We've come a long way in this country with the kind of investment we've made, but technology continues to move, and we must harness that technology. We're on the brink of G. Now we have alternatives to fiber and internet, uh, 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 satellite internet has become more affordable and available. And so where is the technology going to go? Let's follow the technology and make sure that we increase the digitization in the economy and that we make it available to Ghanaian companies to improve their efficiency, but also make it possible for them to, be get, to get capital and investments at lower interest rates. But you cannot bring down the interest rates unless you stabilize the economy. And so that will still be the number one and everything else will be value-added. 
to the economy. So we will continue to push digitization. We'll make it available across the country so that everybody is part of the knowledge economy. We will take of government in terms of digital services so that everybody is able to government uh, services in the shortest possible time without some of the complaints that we hear in respect of um, you know, Goro and all that. It should be possible for people to go online and get services within a certain number of days. And we must make the agencies commit that when you go online and apply for this service, within three days or four days or whatever the time frame is, you will get a response or you would uh, get the service that you're looking for. So yes, we're in a digital economy, but we must, you know, uh, put in the kinds of investments and also put in the kind of effort that will stabilize, you know, the macro environment and also increase productivity so that we are bringing in more uh, um, foreign exchange, we're bringing in more investment and making Ghana truly the hub, you know, for production in Africa. And uh, we'll go to uh, Kamal for Center for Social Justice. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. President. My name is Bashira Tukamal from the Center for Social Justice and also um, a labor activist. I have two questions. The first one, because we are discussing COCO, I want to know whether you think that the powers that the government have in appointing the chief executive of COCO board is also a factor to the issues we have with Ghana COCO board. Because COCO has several divisions, and in every organization there is a certain plan. How come in institutions like COCO board and other areas, we always have to have an appointee who might not necessarily be an agriculturist or understand how the sector works. Then the second one has to do with the issues of fertilizer. I am happy that you actually mentioned the issues that farmers are facing. But don't we think that utilizing farmers cooperative is a great way to go because farmers cooperative, they know their members, they are working together, they are a group, they are contributing, they have their own systems that they use, and they are the best people who can actually identify the farmers within their catchment area and be able to point to who a farmer is and who is not a farmer because, I mean, we've gone to the field and experienced um, cases where farmers themselves do not get the fertilizer, but it's sold through about five people and they buy them times five or times ten, the actual prices. And it's also contributing to the challenges we're currently having with food security. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, the first one is not just COCORD. It's all the state-owned enterprises. Yes. I mean, a new government and, you know, hounds out all the uh, chief executives and upper chief executives. And sometimes the state agency is doing very well. A new chief executive comes, he doesn't have the wherewithal, he's appointed because of his political contribution to a party or because of his influence in a certain party. And over the next period of time, he ran the agency because he just doesn't have what it takes to run the agency. But unless that changes in terms of the appointing authority of the president, you know, then it will continue. I mean... I, I believe that Coco Board needs a shake-up because it doesn't have, have the right administration. But in appointing a new um, uh, a chief executive, not also go and appoint a party apparatchik who has not got the qualification to be able to turn that around. You know, you should appoint somebody who is there, has the capacity to do what it takes to uh, raise that sector. We looked at all the state enterprises and it must be performance related and so when i was in government we used to do a performance of of all the state-owned enterprises and if they were not running uh, we made changes so that somebody else you know goes and continues and you can always move that person somewhere not that he is incapable but maybe he's not the best fit particular uh, sector 
But when you can see the agency collapsing, and it started from 2017, Cocoa Board started with losses. In 2016, Cocoa Board posted a profit and I continued to post a profit in 2017 when the new management came. And since 2017 till I speak, every year Cocoa Board was posting losses. I mean, the president should have seen that and made the kind of change that was necessary to uh, as what was happening. Unfortunately, political loyalty and things is what had a problem, you know, and so we've waited till we've reached where we are. And one of the things was the farmer was not being given, you know, his just reward for farming. The cocoa board headquarters expenditure was going up year on year. I mean, last year, 3.4 billion on headquarters administra administration. It's farmer uh, money that should have gone to the farmers. And it's not the cocoa board, it's all the state agencies. I mean, if you go to the SIGA report, they have huge losses, all of them. Some of them that were breaking even and, you know, actually making a profit have suddenly uh, 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 taken a dive. I mean, even of all the industries Nkrumah um, uh, had, which, which were under the Gihok brand, all the Hig factories collapsed. The only one that survived was Gihok distilleries because they produce alcohol. When Ghanaians are happy, they drink alcohol. When they are sad, they drink alcohol. When they are not happy or they are not sad, they drink alcohol. <laughs> and so Gihok, the series survived. And when I was president, I was called to come and commission a new action line from their own resources. Today, I hear Gihok, the series working, they are owed arrears of salaries. How did that happen? Because the president's in law is the MD. And here he's not in good health. They won't change him. You know, that is the problem. Until we can find a system, you know, that holds these chief executives, you know, to a high step, you know, and have a president who cares about the fact they're operating properly, then we would continue to have this problem. With regards to uh, agriculture and assistance to farmers, yes, we're going to use cooperatives. So when I talk about the farmers service centers, it is going to work with the cooperatives. And so all farmers who expect assistance from government are going to have to belong to a cooperative that is registered and a legal known entity. And on the farmer service center boards, the leaders, members of the cooperative will be members of the board of farmer service center so that they can have a say in how that service center is run. Even though it's going to be private sector run, they would have a board that meets annually to appraise how the service center is running. And every, as I said when I went around during my um, prime, I told um, the people that in order for you to be able to gain um, access to government support, whether in agriculture or in any of the other places where government support is required, you have to come as a legal entity so that government knows that you exist, is able to hold you collectively responsible. That thing about going and giving government support to individuals, and once they get it as individuals, nobody has the intent of using it properly for what it is, or if it's supposed to be a loan, you go give Maslok to uh, Fatima, Ablai, uh, Yasantua, Ajua, Rose, and whatever. Nobody has any intention of paying. But if Ajua, Rose, and Fatima, Ablai, and Yasantua are members of a cooperative, and you say, look, I'm going to give you this money, lend it to your members, and you are responsible for collecting back, you know, uh, the loan that we have given. It is only then that you can get people to be more responsive. And so, yes, we're going to use farmers' cooperatives. Every district is register its uh, farmers' cooperatives, and government support to the farmers' service center is going to go to the cooperatives, and they will be responsible collectively for paying back, so that if one of their members doesn't pay back and it affects their funding the next year, they will collective responsibility to make sure that whoever is giving the support is uh, responsible and pays back. Uh, before I get to up, it could be, uh, so would you, would you recommend that the state on enterprises, the leaders, get still appointed by president or should be a lawyer they could uh, continue constitution? 
Maybe after I finish appointing, then we can. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But I'm not averse to us putting in a system to make sure that persons who are qualified are appointed and they are evaluated, you know, periodically. And if they are not running the enterprise well, to have an organization that will either change them and bring somebody who can run it well. I'm not averse to that. But um, there's no system yet. And so let me make some of those appointments. And I'm, I'm sure that we'll get the right people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll take the one. All right, why don't we last question? Appear could be at one call. Mr. President, my name is Apia Kusi Adamako from CATS International Accra. Mr. President, one thing we know is that competition law is one of the things that drive people to foreign direct investment. Ghana doesn't have a competition law, but we are happy to see that in your 2024 manifesto, the NDC has pledged to Ghanaians that when elected into office, it would enact competition and antitrust law for Ghana. Now, let me go to my main question. How would you uh, intend to leverage on foreign direct investment to help grow up local and domestic champions in the economy? We've realized that at the end of, at the beginning of every financial year, when multinational companies tend to start to remit all their profit, it puts pressure on the city, and the city tends to suffer some hemorrhage. So how would you want to help also grow domestic champions as we seek foreign di direct uh, investment? And finally, I have also examined the manifestos of the two political parties, including that of NDC, and I've realized that it appears that the two major parties are all shifting to the left it was President Reagan who said that when government shifts to the left, it is a decimal point in the national debt that shifts to the right. And so with so many social interventions and free freight things, don't you think that we'll end up crippling the fiscal space we have in this country? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, like you said, um, we need to put in competition and antitrust laws because um, there are areas in which monopolies can hurt, you know, investment. And so we're going to rely on best practice and expertise. I mean, there's a lot of expertise in terms of the legal framework and best practice across the world to be able to, to do that. Um, we need to open up competition so that as many people as possible can get into the various sectors. And based on competition, we can get fairer prices for consumers. And so that's something that's put in the manifesto. Um, growing local champions. I have been an advocate for growing local champions. And um, I've always told my friends, um, we traditionally have been a trading people. And at every point in time, we want to see our investments. And so we have the money, we import the goods, we have the goods, we sell, we get the money. And so at every point in time, we don't want to lose track of our money. But with manufacturing and industry, for a while, you lose track of the money because you set up the factory, you put in the machinery, you are investing, but you don't know whether that money is really going to uh, return a profit. And it's only when the industry is working, you have put in the capital, you've brought the raw material, you've produced, and you've sold before you start seeing money coming in. And we have traditionally been averse to that process. So several of our people, there's one of my friends, he was setting up a factory and to his friends. And they said, ah, for those of you who understand, I didn't say you who, I said, yeah, I'm going to come to the site. Oh, yeah, I'm going to see the factory. See the factory, I'm going to 
Oh, may they be produce soon. I'm going to set up a factory. Ah, that's a factory. They're Indian for the Lebanese for the same factory. <laughs> I just say, yeah, they are near the tongue. <laughs> Let me say that in English. As a friend who was recounting the story, and he was setting up an industry, a factory, to manufacture something locally. And um, his friends had been seeing him for a while. And so when they saw him, they said, ah, where have you been? He says, so I go to my site. They said, what site is that? So I'm setting up a factory to, say, so to produce so, so, and so, so, and so. And he says, factory, why would you be building a factory? It's Lebanese and Indians who build factories, not Ghanaians. <laughs> you know? We need to change that mindset. All people, indigenous investors, can set up manufacturing industries. We've done very well in the pharmaceutical space. There are big Ghanaian uh, pharmaceutical companies. And we can do the other sectors. We can do that in agro-processing. We can do that in textiles. We can do so many other uh, areas. We can do that in plastics. I mean, many areas that we can we can look at. So, growing local champion one of the objectives that we have, and you know, encouraging Ghanaians, you know, to be able to move their investments into other industries other than producing pure water. Everybody is producing, or everybody has an FM station. And it takes one person to do it. Then suddenly everybody's there. But there are many other places we can all spread out. Everybody's into hospitality, building a hotel. You know, but there are many other places we can encourage guys to go. And I'll be one of the chief ambassadors and advocates for doing that and hand-holding them and help to make that investment. And I'm sure that if they are examples of people who have invested in manufacturing and in industry, a lot of the others will follow as it. And so it's something that we can look at. Um, for developing countries, you need to provide some social safety nets. And so even as the economy is adjusting, especially when you go into programs like the IMF and so on and so forth, you have a group of vulnerable people who fall through the cracks and you need to make provision. And that is why there's a need to have some social invention projects. But it must be well thought through and must be adequately funded. And so, for instance, we have the Ghana Education Trust Fund, which has been responsible for building a lot of the educational infrastructure that we have across the length of the country. We have the National Health Insurance Levy that allows poor people to access service without having to pay upfront when they go to a health facility. So I wouldn't say that those are all social interventions that are necessary. I think that they are necessary. We have the free SHS that allows people to send their children to school without having to pay fees, you know, for them to go, so that more children go into secondary school. The only difference between us and the current government was we, the constitution said it should be progressively introduced. And we thought that while we introduced it, we should, be, we should do a fast track rollout of infrastructure because we knew that it was going to lead to an exchange of children coming into secondary school so that we can be able to accommodate them. And that's why we decided to build 200 new schools so that more children could get an accommodation. But the government came and said, no, they're going to roll it out immediately, and they did. And of course, the fallout is, you know, uh, poor nutrition, uh, poor quality food, um, double track system, where some, some stay at home for several months. And so we are dedicated to it and streamlining it. And so one of the things I promised was to hold a stakeholder engagement of teachers and educationists and parents and students and everybody to discuss the implementation of the free SHS so that we can improve it in the shortest uh, possible time. And so um, um, social intervention is important. We've introduced a new one, and that is because when students have gone through the free SHS, the parents are not paying fees in secondary school, and then suddenly the child qualifies for university, and then immediately the parent is required to start paying fees again. And so there are many children who have not been able to continue into university, even though they got an admission, because parents were not able to afford to pay. 
And so there are several have had to pay fees for, and I'm sure there are many people have people coming to them, students coming to them and saying, I got admission, my father or my mother doesn't have, and then if you don't help me, I can't go to school. There was a medical student who was discovered on a farm where and he had gotten admission into medical school, but he couldn't take his uh, position because he couldn't pay the first year fees. We don't want that to happen. At least let them go to the university and start. And it will give the parents the time to adjust. But even then, we need to enhance the student's loan so that when he has gone into university, the first year where we've absorbed the fees, in the second year, he would have registered for the student loan so that in the second year he would use the student loan to be able to finance the fees without um, uh, uh, burning the parents. And then it allows them to go through the university and finish. And the student loan, they start paying when they have finished and gotten a job, and then they start deducting to pay back the student loan. So I do think that social interventions are necessary, but they must be well thought through. The funding for them must be well considered. And we believe that we can fund this no fee stress policy for first year by cutting waste. And um, at least I said, if, if it, it's about 275 million to 290 million thereabouts to be able to absorb those academic fees. And one of the times I said, look, the office of the present budget is 2 point something million. I'm prepared to give up you know, 275 million of that money to fund, <laughs> to fund the no fee stress policy for hundreds of, uh, of thousands of uh, Ghanaian students who will be going to tertiary education. Thank you. Well, I think that comes to the end of my role here. Ms. Friend, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, uh, play uh, a side here with you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I think I will leave uh, with maybe a couple of uh, nuggets here, which is the fact that uh, you pretty much answered all the questions that we had listed. We have collaboration, you know, comes out very loudly in what you talked about. And uh, effective decision making is one I can also think about. But what really calls from A to Z is uh, transparency. And someone once said, you know, uh, sunshine is the best form of disinfectant. Yeah. So if we really do that and be transparent about what we do, I think we can bring down the level of uh, corruption that we find in our environment and all of that and be able to do the right thing for the right people that we have in this country. So I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Please, a big round of applause for His Excellency. He's taking all the questions. Sir, as you can see, the room is full and nobody's leaving. So, but we know that your time is up. Um, he was pretty much at 6 o'clock. I had a call. They said, oh, His Excellency is waiting for us. I had to beg him that, that amount of time he should give us 15 more minutes. So please clap for him for be so much of time. Six, you are waiting for us, so thank you. And um, we would like to thank you. We'll make it very short because we know you have to leave. On behalf of the consortium, we extend our deepest gratitude to you for showing up and speaking to the issue. And uh, please consider businesses, your friends and partners, where you get to the political kingdom again. So we say God bless you, okay. and we'll see you soon. All right, people. Yes. Where are the members of the consortium? Please let's take a picture with them and keep it for the records. Okay. Right. Uh, so, if you have international trade association here, I'm not part of the consortium. Please. We, we want to deal with the leaders of the trade association. Please. All right. How do you go? Yes.